When I was a child, I would drag out my chalkboard, which was as big as I was, from behind my bedroom door. I would drag it down the hallway to the living room, and I would lean it up against the cocktail table, what we called the coffee table. And I would uh, create, a, create school, right? Create my classroom. My students were imaginary, not to me, they were quite real. Um, and I would rip out coloring book pages and I would create assignments. Gregory and Marianne often ended up with their names on the board. They were the unruly ones. But from that, I learned a lot of things as my mom would watch me play school. My mom was the one that would always make flashcards, not to complement any curriculum that was happening in school because the flashcards were created well before school started. And there was no note cards, it was just pieces of paper cut out with words on them, simple words, words from the kitchen, bread, butter, and then simple math problems and numbers to get used to those as well. Having been taught those things pretty early on, I can talk about now about the role that my mom and other women have played in my life in terms of education, in terms of teaching and learning, in terms of things that have intersected with teaching and learning along the way. Those things being faith and doubt, those things being matriarchy and leadership, and those things that have really influenced my life along the way, which is our relationships with other women. My mom put me into Catholic school when first grade started, mostly because my brother, who was seven years older, we had the opportunity to go to the same school since it was one, grades one through eight. So for two years, my brother and I were both at that same school. When I was in second grade, my mom was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and learned at the time that she was really sick and that used to make me very sad. Back then, you could rent a bed and a bed was brought into my room so that a grandmother might be able to stay with me while my mom was in the hospital for quite a long time. Later I learned that my dad was told it was a 50-50 shot as to whether it is she would survive. She lived for 40 years with Crohn's disease, but that time was an important time for me and something that, of course, you remember when you're seven of having a grandmother's come through your house to stay with you in a rented bed right next to your twin bed that had Winnie the Pooh bed sheets on it. From there then, in that Catholic school setting, um, one of the things that I remember from third grade was being chosen to be Mary in the Christmas pageant. Now, my Catholicism is very much part of who I am. It's traditions, it's faith, but as I mentioned before, it's the doubt that comes with that as well. In third grade, for that role of Mary, Nana, Eleanor, whose house was here in Westchester and whose red kitchen I sat in for many, many, many hours, created my garb, created my costume for being Mary. It was out of light blue bed sheets because that's of course what Mary wore, and a pillowcase for my veil, and bed sheets, the, the fitted sheet became what went over my clothes. That Christmas pageant in the front of the church took a really long time because as third graders, some of those things do take a long time. The journey to the inn was exceptionally long. As I followed Brian Zidell, Joseph, around the sanctuary way too many times. <laughs> but I also remember a key moment in that play that has stuck with me throughout the rest of my life. There's a time in the Bible where Mary talks to Elizabeth. She goes to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the mother of John. And after she is expecting Jesus, she goes to Elizabeth and the two of them hang out, Mary and Elizabeth. I love that story. Throughout my time, throughout in learning all about the Bible, women in the Bible have become most inspirational to me. 
So Mary goes to, to hang out with Elizabeth. And here's what I think happened. They hung out talking about the aches and pains of being pregnant. They probably griped about the guys in their life but they were really so happy to be with each other. Here they were, two women, about to give birth to the most famous men in the history of the world. When Mary encounters Elizabeth, she has a prayer. This prayer actually comes from the Old Testament, and it's called the Magnificant. The Magnificant was what I memorized in third grade. Did I have to? No. But did I? I did. It begins with the phrase, my being proclaims the greatness of the Lord. That has stuck with me because I think anyone's being proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And that has what kind of kept coming through my mind throughout the rest of my time in Catholic school and then further on. I then went uh, after high school to the University of Illinois. But looking back, it didn't go well. Uh, I probably had and needed to see a counselor at the time, but didn't know enough to do that. So I made a switch and ended up going to St. Norbert College, which is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, a return to more Catholic education. It worked out better there. I found my spouse after I made my way through a few of his friends, but that's what <laughs> happens. <laughs> and ultimately, uh, essentially found a love for a lot of things. I found a love for learning outside of the classroom. Certainly, I enjoyed my classes. I enjoyed being an English major. I enjoyed storytelling and I enjoyed writing. Of course I did. I was going to also be an English teacher, but I very wrongfully thought that all education courses were about making bulletin boards. I didn't know any better. That's not the case, but that's what I saw. So I dropped the education part and on a wing and a prayer decided just to graduate with English not really knowing what to do. Walking across that campus one day, I realized that I was enjoying the time I was spending outside the classroom even more than I was enjoying inside the classroom. So in recognizing you could do that as a job, decided to pursue higher education in that capacity. After Ohio University and then working at Aurora University, decided I wanted to get a doctorate. So I pursued one at Loyola University of Chicago. It took me nine years, not something that I would recommend for anybody, but it did take nine years. And in choosing Loyola, it was very purposeful on a number of levels. Loyola was known at the time as having an exceptional higher education program, but also I wanted to be in the city. I knew my life might be in the Chicago area and I wanted to stay in the city in order to pursue my, my doctorate. In doing that too, Loyola has a, a motto about light the fire within. And that is something that I think has, has, has propelled me to think about work with students. Lighting the fire within, access to education, putting those two things together so that students can find the light that burns within them in order to, to move forward. Throughout all of that time, too, and in completing the doctorate, I then moved on to North Park University. Um, and now, at this point, I have been a vice president for over 10 years. Not necessarily something that I thought would happen, and yet here it is with these years of experience. Along the way, certainly, a few things have happened. Um, I would say this, both in the personal sense and in the professional sense, there have been a number of defining things that puts a perspective on how I look at work and how I look at leadership. About four years ago, right before the pandemic started, um, my sister-in-law passed away. My sister-in-law had fought breast and ovarian cancer for over 13 years. And she knew enough to know that she had outlived every medical journal article written about breast and ovarian cancer. And she had that BRCA gene that is hereditary in her family. She had beat cancer. She had gotten sick from chemo. She had cardiac arrest on her bathroom floor one night and passed away in January. My niece, junior in high school, my nephew was 13. In that moment, things change. Things change. And my sister-in-law 
was so incredibly strong. She, when she could no longer work, she became the PTA president. When she couldn't go to events, she would do fundraising for breast cancer research. But in turn, what happened is that that niece and nephew of mine have become like my own, so that I love them as I would my own child. Prior to that, um, getting to have a family on my own and to become a mother wasn't the easiest of journeys. It actually took some time. Um, my husband, Mike, who I met at St. Norbert, we uh, were married 10 years before my daughter came along. I've often said that happened by God's timeline and not necessarily my own. Um, but I think she was worth the wait. When I learned that I was expecting a daughter, it was such a sense of relief because inside I had felt that I was supposed to be a mother of a daughter. And if it wasn't, that meant I had to keep going on a journey to get that, that daughter <laughs> that I knew that I was supposed to have. She came along and you know, you create a life of figuring out what that all means. I am in a space and in a family where my spouse, what he really wants to be when he grows up is a mom. He has said it to my daughter. This works out and I am very lucky as it complements what it is our lifestyle is. When my daughter was young, he cut back and went part time and I was the, was the one working. When, he was, when Lila was in preschool prior to the start of the pandemic, which has changed things as there are a lot more mothers and fathers at games and pickups now after the pandemic, Mike would be one of the only men uh, picking up from, from preschool. I remember those things because there were moments where a teacher would say, oh, you're here. But I remember thinking, but he's been here every single time. He's been here every single time. She is learning some things by having him being active in her life, different than what I could teach her when I'm spending time doing, doing other things. So the combination of things that have happened, the road to becoming a mother, the road of becoming an aunt in a mother role, sort of propelled me into a role of the matriarch sooner than I thought as well. When my mom passed away a couple of years ago, um, I realized a few things in the moment. I was at the, the funeral home and the wake, and there's that sad moment when you really have to say goodbye. It was in that moment that beautiful music was playing. There was a violinist accompanied by a pianist. It was simply beautiful. And there you are in the front row, and I have my brother on one side, and I have my dad on the other side. My daughter, my, other, my niece, my nephew were all behind me. But in that row, I came to recognize that I was the matriarch of the family. I was the only woman left of my family and the oldest at that point. And that was quite striking, being someone so influenced by my own mother, by my grandmothers, but now I was taking that role and I'll, taking that role a little sooner than I thought might be the case. In that beautiful moment with the music and the violin playing and the pianist and all of that, suddenly someone started to sing. And it was one of those moments where you don't expect the singing to start and you're kind of, you're kind of jarred awake as if, oh, I didn't expect that. It was at that point that my brother who's sitting at my right leans over and says to my dad, did you pay extra for that? <laughs> and here we are in that moment, and I think, ah, that's my mom. That's my mom reminding us to, to laugh, to always be joyful, to think of the things that are most important, and to find some humor, some humor in those things. So I think I am quick to laugh because she was quick to laugh. And those kinds of things, I think, come through and hopefully can come through to my daughter as well. So now on a, on a more professional note of some things, of what I've learned from these women in my life and how it brings it into 
the professional setting that I'm in. It's interesting that there are only 30% of college presidents are women. It's remained that rate for a long time, but 60% of college students are women. And so the fact that we have a female president is actually quite not a minority. It's not the norm. It's not the norm. To be then at the level where I am now, oftentimes I see some things in a couple of spaces where I find the things that I've learned from the women in my life can come into play quite nicely. Being the voice, not just of a voice of inclusion, but being a voice that is loud enough to be heard as well. I find in working in the area of student affairs within higher education is often thought of being the touchy-feely side and sort of the soft side. And sometimes that then is, is judged. I have encountered that. I have encountered that. I just go back and think, well, research shows that it kind of works. So if you create spaces where there's welcome, students will stay. If you create spaces where they feel that they matter, they'll keep coming back. And it's in those approaches that that leads me to think you get to the hard facts of the money that you need in the budget. And when you have to make some tough decisions, coming at it from a lens of inclusion can actually be quite beneficial in the long way down the road. As moms, you learn how to say things and when to say them. Really hard to do. Because as a mom, I want to say exactly what I am thinking in the moment that I am thinking them to said child. But that doesn't always work. Because then she looks at me in the way that I looked at my mom at 13, which is where we are now. And I remember those feelings quite vividly and running back into the bedroom and closing that bedroom door with tears coming down my face for whatever it is that, that, that my mom would have said to me. So you, you decide strategically when you might say something to your child. I do a lot of time, I spend a lot of time thinking when I'm going to say something strategically in my job. I'm going to leave it with you that you can only imagine how much strategy that I think behind when I say what I think is important to be said to get to the end result. That communication and that transparency, those are things that women as mothers seem to be able to have and be able to contribute. So when I think of the women in my life from my mother, my grandmother Eleanor from Westchester, my sister-in-law Mia, and now as I see it in the next generation, I don't see touchy-feely. I see some incredible strength that will propel them to wherever it is that they want to go. I made a decision to be in education, and I made the decision to work in a community college space. The idea of access very much resonates with me, which has led me to where I am today. My faith and my doubt, all of those things also make me who I want to be. And at times, I will say, in that journey of faith and doubt and Catholicism, those are all things that make me who I am as well. Hey, I, here I am talking at the end of a Women's History Month celebration, and I belong to a church that only allows men to be priests. A question my daughter once asked of me as, when she was little and were walking out of church, to which the woman in front of me turned around and said, I'm going to listen to see how you answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> I simply said, it's just for men, but that's something that you can change when you're older. Here's the thing with it. There are bits and pieces of my own faith that resonate more with me than other things. It's not my cause to change that within the church for which I belong. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to be more in the educational space about access for education and the commitment that comes to promising access by helping someone be successful as well. Those are the convictions that have propelled me in my job and to be here. 
but also in my role as this newly found matriarch, something I didn't expect to happen. I think these stories are really important. And one of the things that was said in my doctoral program a long time ago is this idea that we call, carry culture with us. We carry culture with us. At times, at times, in the space of a public community college, we don't talk about the things that create who we are and our own identity. But we should in that we create the spaces where we're in by bringing who we are to them in their totality. I like to think of Triton as we become who our students are. So we should become who their culture and who their identities are, and then we adjust to make, to make sure that they feel that welcome and care. So as I talk about things, I do it with strategy and intentionality. That you may know a little bit about me, that you might find some sliver of relevance in it for your own story, but I find in those storytellings, though, that's what connects us and that's what makes it all worthwhile. Um, in the meetings that I sit in, I will share this. I have probably wrongly sat around the table and I've added up the years of experience of the people that, that have experience at Triton compared to what I bring to the table. And that can be pretty intimidating at times. But I've learned how to navigate that. I've learned how to show a commitment to strategically use my voice to make a difference for people and to say, you know what, this is where I am, this is where I've chosen to be. And in some ways, because of the open access missions, I have thought this might be the most Christian space that I've worked in, in terms of offering a place where my, our arms can be wide open and we don't prohibit people from coming from an astronomical price tag that would prohibit people from coming. So it's a meaningful place for me to be. I'm so grateful that you're willing to listen to that story and get to know a little bit about the story behind my face. But know that all of you have these stories and I love hearing them. It's part of why you will see me walking around with a coffee cup. Here's why, I do love coffee, it's a thing. It's well known in some of my circles, okay. but. I got that from Nana. I got that from Nana in her red kitchen, in these tiny coffee cups with the percolator coffee, coffee pot that was plugged in on the wall, right? And using whole milk, which she drank with pizza, <laughs> and saccharin, those little tiny pellets that you would put, <laughs> pellets, you would put into your coffee or sweetener. But what happened at that table? I saw Nana and my mom and myself talk and bond. If you have a cup of coffee in your hand, I would like to think, sure, you want the caffeine. But it's also an invitation to talk, to have a conversation, to share something in common, and that's really what this work and everything is all about. Thanks for listening. <laughs>